Practicing from a crate. We should always use a whiplash turn out of a car or a crate indoors and outdoors. So in this video, you'll see a 180 degree turn out of the crate using a lure. And our little friend Taffy loves the game enough to go back in the crate for another rep, which is adorable and also great because it uh, creates a lovely training loop. And hopefully your dog will start doing that too because the game is so much fun. Ready? Let's go. Good girl. Very good. Cutie pie. <laughs> so adorable. Uh, anyway, so the fact that Taffy wants to play the game again, hopefully your dog will do that too. You create love for the game so that the dog will create the nice clean loop for you, trot back in the crate. Make sure you practice a 90 degree turn. This was a 180 degree turn. The dog turned all the way around to the back of the crate. And you should also work to both sides. So four permutations altogether, 90 degrees to either side and 180 degrees to either side. Let's take a look at what it looks like coming out of a car. Perfect. So that's our friend Chili again, a 90 degree whiplash turn exiting from the crate. And you can clearly see the value of having your dog exit on a turning path rather than charging straight ahead out of the car or crate. So whiplash is not just for cars and crates. Um, this is an example of using a whiplash turn at a doorway. When you're, whether you're going from room to room indoors or whether you're going in and out of a building as we're going to be doing here, this is Dodge working on politeness, going outdoors, using a whiplash turn to check in with his mom. Watch his face. He does not charge straight ahead. He's turning toward his mom even as he exits. Yeah, good job. How pretty is that? Good job. And call him again. Good. Beautiful. Beautiful. There's no denying that it's a flexible game and that's a skill that we want for the dog to be always orienting toward us by choice. So I think you should create great love for the whiplash turn in every direction in lots of different situations before you ever feel like you need to fade the cookie lure. So a summary so far, this is the basic three games in a four part sequence that we're going to go through um, using all four steps sequentially to make a huge difference in how your dog feels about the environment you want to blend with. So you and your dog can become optimistic about a road trip in the future. So next I'll have some examples of how to put these patterns to work together, how to implement that four part sequence. Um, and we will begin with, are we there yet? <laughs> the nose knows. Uh, this is my friend Cider's nose. I love this. She's not looking out of a crate with her eyes like a human would do. She's getting a ton of information from her nose. It's always fascinating to watch how active your dog's nose is in a new place, isn't it? And it's a very good way to study how your dog takes a breath. So this is a good reason to begin each arrival with the take a breath game. And that's what I recommend. Look at your crate set up in your car. Can you play take a breath from the driver's seat of your small car or from the inside of your big van before you even open the doors? That would be helpful. So let's always look at parking. It's always a struggle, isn't it? When we need more space than we have. So these classmates have oriented their cars with the dog access points facing each other. That's by choice. They're making use of the distance they want, but they've also placed themselves for the level of challenge that their dogs are ready for. When they first started coming to class together, the cars were front to front. So the dog's access points were facing away from each other, of 
course. Practice first in an environment with a great big parking area so you can work with your patterns at a distance and then gradually get closer to the action. That just makes sense. Many dog sport situations do not have parking flexibility. So that won't be the time you want to practice. That's when you put your practicing to the test. Whether your dog or someone else's dog is having trouble, you might need to stay in your very own bubble around your car. So that means barriers are your friend. With control and leash training, all my classes start out with protected contact, as we call it. Our separators keep each dog with their person. So the barriers are not about abandonment. It's about feeling safe so that they can ignore each other. That's the foundation you want. You'll be able to leave and return as your dog gains experience, but start off using barriers in your training at home, even if you don't need them, just because that's great antecedent training for confinement. When you're parked, you can create an X-Pen car bubble like this in the picture on the right. Put an X-Pen in an arc across your rear bumpers to create a buffer between you and the world going by. If you're in a crowded space, that makes just a huge difference, giving your dog a protected zone. So we're going to start with take a breath up and down in the car crate. <laughs> so very important, opening your car door, opening the crate door. These are not cues to exit. That's very, very important antecedent training for you to have before you take your arrival skill set on the road. But when you first arrive in the new environment, you're going to notice in this video, I put the leash on while the dog is inside the crate. That's very important. It's actually more important than just taking the dog's collar in your hand. Yes, take the dog's collar in your hand, but attach the leash before you let the dog exit the crate. <laughs> Take a breath. Very good. Very nice. See how I'm cueing that? I hold the cookie to my nose, and that cues Comet. To breathe consciously. Look at him showing me what a good breather he is. And now we're playing up and down. There's a cookie bowl inside his crate. Good boy. So as soon as I held the collar up for him to see, he knows the drill. He got up, shook himself. Um, he's wearing his winter coat because it's chilly out there. And he gets ready to um, get his collar and leash on. He knows the drill. His crate door opens, but he does not step out because the drill is you put your collar on inside the crate. That's our routine. Familiar routines are very comforting in unfamiliar places, so you're going to want to put some thought into what you want your routine to be. Work it out for getting your dog dressed in the car. So I'm practicing here just outside my garage, and I recommend that. This routine is now ready for the road. He looks great, right? So let's take it on the road. This is Kool-Aid, and you'll notice I have a different routine with her. Kool-Aid steps half out of her crate before I release her. Why would I want that? I'm still putting her collar on, her leash on while she's in the crate, but she's um, stepping out. Actually, no, she steps out to receive her collar and leash. Anyway, I'll show you and then I'll tell you why I do it that way.
when you're practicing, go in and out and in and out like that because you don't want your dog to feel once they get out that they've escaped. It's no big deal to go back in. Um, the car is an important safe haven and a, an attractive place to be. So you should play the in and out and in and out repeatedly as you practice. So Kool-Aid steps out when I pick up her leash. That's our routine. She already had her leash on, so that was put on in the crate, but sometimes I might not do that. I'm just being honest. But this is because that half out position is important for Kool-Aid because I often put a harness on her and half out is our position for that because I can't do it in the crate. So I had to work out something different. In this video, I'm not using a harness. So we pause halfway because that's the routine. And then we just move into the next uh, piece of the behavior chain. So what will your routine be? Um, yours doesn't have to look like mine. I think it's wise to do put the leash or collar on your dog while they are still in the crate. Um, you'll have your own um, routine for whether your dog wears a collar in the crate or not. And that's up to you. You can work it out to your own satisfaction, but know what you're doing and why, and try to build a routine that both you and the dog are comfortable with. So you could, if you don't like the half out position where I put Kool-Aid's harness on, maybe you could use a verbal that your dog doesn't exit half out the crate until you give a verbal cue for that. And that would give you more control and your dog would be in the crate rather than half out until you say, step up so I can put your harness on. That might work for you. You'll have to think about it yourself and then train it so that you and the dog get comfortable with it. So now let's continue on with our friend Comet. When we do our whiplash turn out of the car, out of the crate, then we're going to go back to our up and down game again. And I hope you'll see the value of that and why it's so important. It's because the world looks mighty different from outside the car. We need the up down game again after we exit the car. We can't just whiplash out of the crate and bop into the building because that won't go well. So take time outside the car to play the up and down game again. This is a very important step. Your dog will be able to take in much more information because there will be much more for them to see. So a little review to show that he's ready. Perhaps you've now taken all your gear into the building and you're coming back for your dog. Whiplash turn. And up and down. <laughs> So at this point, you want your dog to pause the game and look around. So don't be in a hurry. Now's the time for curiosity. I suggest you play up and down at the bumper. Go in and out as many times as you want to. Um, you'll be able to gauge your dog's readiness. And then I advise you to play again up and down beside the car so your dog can get a look at where you want to walk to next. Stay close to the car at first and keep your car open because that is your dog's safe haven. And I'm going to show you how that plays out on a regular basis with um, reactive, stressed, or anxious, or overeager dogs. So remember your antecedent training. Your dog needs to love their car. The car is a safe haven when stuff happens, and guess what? It will happen. So here are Karen and Kazi minding their own business. Karen's working on her intonation of three for the one, two, three game. And um, her car is right here in my garage in a protected space. 
but boom, Kazi explodes. She looks calm, relaxed, awesome. happy, yeah, I know. But right up until she's not. Look at the change. But it does sound chipper, and it sounds different from how your two is going to sound, which is very important. Boom. So Karen grabs the leash, but I'm calling out to her back in the crate, back in the crate. That's what your automatic reaction needs to become. When the unexpected happens, and it might not be your dog who blows up, it might be somebody else's dog walking by who blows up, it doesn't matter. Your dog needs to be safe, and your dog needs to feel safe in their car, and especially in their crate. Yeah, look at this. As soon as Kazi's in her car, the instant she was back in the crate, she was calm again. And that's why your car needs to remain at the ready. You might need it in a hurry. You can't predict that. Here, the back of the car is open and Kazi's crate is also open. I recommend that. She gladly hopped in and immediately felt better. So therefore, she's not practicing the reactivity. So the car is your touchstone as you venture forth. Now we're going to add another set of skills. If the first set of skills, your arrival skills, go well, and you want to go further, you want to get in the building, for example, you want to be part of the event, you want to uh, do more than just be on the outskirts, you want to join, then you're going to need more games. I think the arrival skills all by themselves will change your life. But the entry skills can make you part of the action. So the antecedent is you're going to need value for stationing. And the three games that we're going to cover here, the motion games to get you into where the action is, are ping pong, one, two, three, and mat work. We'll start with ping pong. And I transitioned to ping pong from the stationary up-down game. You could consider ping pong a game of moving up-down because it is a start button game. You're going to need the start button, but the cookies are now being placed or tossed from side to side and not just dropped down near your feet. So up-down is a stationary game with dropped cookies and an eye contact start button. Ping pong is a back and forth motion game with tossed cookies and an eye contact start button. So the two games are compatible and they work well together. We can morph stationary up down into ping pong by gradually delivering the cookies to the side to add motion. And that's a great way to get ready to move from the car, for example out into the space. So you can also morph it the other way. When you need to bring the energy back down, you can morph down from ping pong to up and down. Uh, motion is added gradually, of course, you know that. But you don't have to add it evenly to both sides. It's fine to use targets to keep track of your distances, as you see here. And the one target in this picture is gradually going inside the pen. So it starts closer to the handler, and it gradually gets moved further and further into the pen. So we can acclimate the dog to the, at the doorway from being outside the pen to being inside the pen as the cookies go back and forth. So the ping pong game has a lot of flexibility, strengthens our connection, and that start button behavior of eye contact is equally important both in the stationary up down and in the motion ping pong. Both games require the dog to connect with the handler after each cookie. That becomes challenging in ping pong, I'm just going to tell you, because the dog is moving and pretty soon the dog is going to, he learns the pattern and he's going to presume to go for the next cookie toss as soon as he eats the previous cookie toss. But that would leave you out of the equation, which would kill the value of the game. So we're not going to do it that way. And here's what to do when that happens to you, because it will. Every Control Unleashed game has a structure that strengthens our connection. The start button behavior of eye contact 
comes easily in the up and down game, which is why we do that one first. But in ping pong, it's easy for the dog to gloss over the start button part. So let's see how we handle that. Yes. yes. And now <laughs> make him stop, too. His, His feet, feet need to stop. stop. Yeah, yeah good. good. Well, well done. done. Yeah, good, good job, job, Elena. Elena. So, so you, you see, see what, what I mean. mean. Don't, Don't fall, fall for that, that. when he gives you a passing glance and continues walking to the next target. That's, that's not good enough. enough. He's 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 yeah. yeah. That's all right. He'll get the pattern. This is a good game for you to practice. He, he will learn, learn the pattern. pattern. Yeah. And, and I, I like, like your marker. marker. Adding the yes. 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 Um, but, but next time, time make him stop his feet. feet. Oh, yes. So it gets tricky yes. to Good. practice. I like that. You, you just slowed down, down the pace of the, of the game, game. And that, that was, was a good decision. decision. Yes. Very, Very well, well done. done. Yes. Good job. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, I see. I just need to, as always, slow myself down. Yeah, me too. <laughs> we yeah. tend to rush. I noticed that. I love it. We're keeping the energy very low in this situation. There are other students and other dogs active in the area and we want to make sure that nobody goes over the top diving and chasing and running after the treats because that's just a recipe for disaster um, here the um, prefrontal cortex is being used on every single rep because the dog is being asked to keep his clear criteria of the start button behavior stop his feet and look at the handler consciously saying um, the next rep, please. That would be excellent. Okay, so let's take a look at using ping pong in a real life reactivity situation indoors. So here's an example of the power of ping pong to transition a dog from the limbic brain back to the thinking brain. <laughs> this is our friend Kazi again at home and she is frustrated and ramping up she wants to be part of the action on the other side of the gate, and we want her to calm herself and get back into her thinking brain. So we're gonna use the motion plus the tight rule structure of ping pong, but I want you to see the before because I was lucky enough to capture it. And um, this is what we're dealing with. All right, so we're going to use the motion plus the tight rule structure of ping pong to sort of meet her halfway. So we'll actually be letting her express some energy at the start, and then we'll gradually sort of bring the energy down. We're going to meet her where she is. She'll need her thinking brain to process the start button requirement. That's important. Ping pong's start button rule is to stop in the middle where the handler is and offer direct eye contact. And that's how she'll cue the next cookie toss. So the motion games show you clearly how important it is to teach the patterns well and create the love for each game before you need them and certainly before you try to take them on the road. Let's look at ping pong. Whoa. Even just now, before I start the video, look at that dog. Same dog, same situation. And this is not staged. Look at that lovely eye contact, calm face, calm tail, calm body language throughout. Can it really be just a couple minutes later? And yes, it is a couple minutes later. This is the same dog in the same situation. Ping pong is magic for a dog who needs to move. Ah! 
That's a dog who's thinking. The start button makes the control unleashed patterns both calming and empowering. So here's a trick about all the games, but it comes up all the time with ping pong. You really should try to start the pattern before you need it. So how obvious does that sound? And yet, um, we don't do it. We stand around and then we see something. And so we start a pattern because there's an environmental challenge, but it's much more effective when you're practicing any pattern, including ping pong, much more effective to start the pattern before a trigger shows up. So that will greatly increase the chance that the momentum of already being in a pattern that they enjoy will win the day for you. So the dog who's already engaged in a pleasant pattern has a lot of resistance to distraction because momentum is on your side. So wherever you go, warm up with your CU patterns. Just make it your habit. So this is Dan entering the protected contact pen. And there will be a helper dog, okay. but so he doesn't know when. Before your dog helper comes, you can ping pong between two targets. Yeah. yeah. So, so then you'll stand in the middle. He reports to you in the middle with face contact. That, that is beautiful. Yes. yes. Exactly. Exactly. Because, because you, you want, want to establish a pattern, a, pattern, a pleasing, relaxing, relaxing pattern, pattern before the helper, helper comes. comes. All right, on to the next game. Loose dog! <laughs> Sometimes you just got to get across the room or you want to get from your car to the building or from the hallway to the bathroom or from your crate to the ring. The best way to get from here to there in a bubble is by using the control unleash game called one, two, three. There is a different version for when you want your dog to process the environment, but both versions use the same structure one, two, three. So let's train that now. I use a back chaining system for training the one, two, three game means I start with only three and treat. So one is going to mean game on, two is going to mean I'm reaching for a treat, and three is the magic word. Three, it means a treat is coming right now. <laughs> Three. Three. Yeah. Good girl. Three. Good girl. <laughs> so practice saying three with the intonation that you want. How will you say it when you play the game for real? Practice that and develop it so you can be consistent. My intonation is three. <laughs> So even when you're only saying three out of context and paying each time you say it to develop that high, high um, act, attraction for the word, practice the intonation that you're going to want to use. Now let's add two. Then I add the two and I make a point of getting a treat ready as I say two. So that's what I'll be saying in this video. I'm reaching into my pocket. You could reach into the bait pouch and as you say to, and that lets you get the treat ready to deliver on three. three. So just reviewing a couple reps of just saying three without the two, and then we'll add the two. Okay, okay that's good. good. So, so we're, we're going to progress. progress. When I add the two, two I'm, I'm also, also going to add a physical cue that, that um, accentuates what I mean by two. By two. So, so, of course, three is the perfect predictor of cookie delivery. 
So, so two, two is, is going to be the predictor of hand going, going into the pouch or pocket to uh, uh, grab, grab a cookie, cookie that I can deliver on three. So, so two, two is going to be very important. important. Two, two, it's a tertiary, tertiary level, level of prediction, but it's going to be just as important. Two. two. Two, three. Two, three. <laughs> they love seeing me reach for the cookie, so that adds value to my two as a predictor of three. And here's the whole game with these two. One means game on. The dogs want to be involved. My enti entire pattern now of one, two, three has high value as a game that keeps my dog's focus on me and the activity associated with each number. I want their attention to remain with me and not on the environment in one, two, three. Reviewing value for three. Two. Good girl. Three. Three. Good girl, Good girl Wiki. Wiki. One. Two. Notice I reach for the cookie on two and I present it on three. Two. Three. Very nice. You are ready. You're ready. <laughs> so the best use for me of walking one, two, three game is that my dog and I remain in motion together, even while I'm feeding the treats. So there's some antecedent training for you because walking and chewing gum at the same time for both the handler and the dog is a challenge. So my ultimate goal is to take several brisk steps between the numbers so that I can cross a big open space very quickly with my dog hopefully never thinking bad thoughts. I don't want to cause a reaction. I want to use one, two, three to get from here to there. It deserves all the training and the practice you can give it. Here's what it looks like when you put it all together, the entire game with one trained dog instead of two. And this is how I will use it in public. So I don't care about little things like her hopping around. What I love is that as soon as she saw what game it was, she dropped her stick She's all in. She doesn't need a leash in order to stay with me. Three. Good. <laughs> she even gets into parallel path when she hears two. two. Three. See how I say two and she flips around so she's walking beside me? That's a big advantage. That's how I'll use the game. The dog won't be facing me. We'll be walking together. So I, I want to say a little thing about leash. Your dog will be within leash distance of you because you'll be using this game on leash. However, um, if your dog won't stay with you without the leash, that's not good enough, in my opinion. If you have to be on leash because otherwise your dog won't stay in the game, then I don't think the game will hold up for you on the road. So train your one, two, three sequence the way I showed you so it has very high value. And then practice as much as possible. Practice at home off leash as much as you can, because your goal is for your dog to want 
to glue themselves to you. So one, two, three is pretty much a long duration focus game where you don't want the dog looking around. You don't want the dog interacting with the environment. So if there's only me and the game and a handful of treats and my dog's full focus remained upon me and the game for the whole session, that's the win. So I say this game is ready to go on the road. So I have another version of one, two, three, which we call voluntary one, two, three. And this is for when, yes, I want to get from here to there. And I am using the one, two, three protocol. However, I do want my dog to look around and pause the game and process the environment. So I'm including this variation on the one, two, three game for when you want to move together, but you also do want your dog to look around like they do in the up down game. So here we'll put the treat on a target, but remember the treat could always go beside your shoe or on your shoe if you don't happen to have a cookie bowl or a target with you. Here I'm just defining the game. That was a cursory glance, wasn't it? And I recommend that you do define the game like this. So your dog will give the start button like he's doing there. Try to slow down. Put a little space between one and two and three. Good. So ultimately, the targets will be spread further apart. So the dogs know that they'll be taking more steps before they get another opportunity for the cookie to go down and they'll use that start button. Our uh, CU dogs are pretty well target trained that when there's a target, they're attracted to it. Something good happens at the target. Mm -hmm. And when the dog looks up at the handler, we move to the next target. There are a lot of CU games like that. So if your dog is trained in targets are attractive and targets, you know, require a certain behavior or a behavior chain, then the targets will help you and your dog learn the voluntary one, two, three version uh, pretty quickly. Okay, so voluntary one, two, three practice. It sounds so easy, but every game takes practice to put the pieces together in the correct order. So here is Dodge practicing voluntary one, two, three to get from the entrance of the pen to the station what game in are the we pen. On the way to the station. Okay, voluntary one, two, three. Perfect. Well, you can one, two, three right back to the gate. Okay, okay, he, he didn't, didn't look at you, at you and, he, and he, is, he is ready for us to require that he look up at you. At you. So, so it's, it's not, not eye contact, but it is face contact. contact. Good. Good. Good job. And stay. And stay. stay. Good. Good. Good job. Good. Good. So... Good, Good job, Ellen. Good, Good job. job. Wait. Good. <laughs> Beautifully done. Clear criteria for the win. All right. Last thing is our mat work. The value for the mat is about the love. And I'm mentioning this because I get complaints. My dogs are not always 100% on their mats. And the part that you need for the arrival skill set is simply down and chill, not anxious, not fidgety. Um, as Leslie always says, fidgety dogs do not stay on mats. So therefore, choose a location for your mat where you have your dog's back and they feel safe. Protect your dog's personal space. Don't let people just come up and presume to touch them and everything. You're asking a lot of your dog with mat work, especially in a busy place. So they have to be able to trust you to protect their privacy. <laughs> Your dog's mat. Mat work is tough. Your dog's mat is their well-defined place to be in public. So practice mat work and build the mat love because you are going to need it. So here, Kool-Aid's head is off the mat. No problem. I don't care about that. Her head is down. I don't require that either. I don't care about that. She is fully meeting the spirit of the work. This next 
several slides is the story of Kool-Aid waiting with me while my car is being serviced at the dealership. Good girl, Kool-Aid. She's down and chill. I came for a state inspection, which would be about an hour, possibly two. But unfortunately, I got a very bad surprise. Um, my car happened to need $2,700 worth of repairs, and we would be there all day long. It was terrible news in every way, as you can imagine. So this is about trying to give my poor dog some degrees of freedom in a situation where, frankly, her life is going to suck. After a few hours, I took her outside. And understandably, she thought we were leaving. And then we came back inside, and I spread her mat out again. And this was her reaction. You can hardly blame her. She didn't lie down, and I just didn't have the heart to tell her to lie down. Um, somehow I wanted to give her some degree of freedom. So I just sat down and got out my computer. It, it does suck for her. She did not lie down, but she's not misbehaving. She chose to sit, so I let her sit. It's the only agency she has. She will lie down if I tell her to, but I'm just not going to do it. I didn't do it. She was so patient lying down for a few hours already by this point. I have my computer. I can work and I have to work. She has one degree of freedom here in these pictures. She can sit or she can lie down. She chooses to sit. That's fine. I let her sit for a while, and then I took her outside for another walk. So, did that reinforce li not lying down? <laughs> oh, poor thing, who cares? She's being so calm. So, let's just say I'm reinforcing calm by taking her outside. When we came back inside, I changed the placement of her mat. And when she decided to lie down, I got out some cookies, and we played a little pocket hand feeding game in the down position. And then she was on her own again. We were there for eight hours. After a while, she got up and left the mat and settled on the carpet underneath the side table by my chair. So again, that's agency at work. It's like she found another degree of freedom and I let her have it. On this slide, I've written what I was trying to un accomplish in this unhappy situation. Um, I feel like it can't just be about mat rules, right? Mat rules say you have to, you know, be on the mat. Even I say, okay, she's not on the mat. Like, <laughs> but it can't just be about the rules. It's about our relationship and about the next time I'm going to ask for mat work. So I let her do this. What would you do? This is the agency I chose to give her. She had so few degrees of freedom. Um, in that situation. And to my thinking, she did meet criteria. She is down and she's chill. She's not happy, but she's down and she's chill. So I chose to go with that and let her lie where she wanted to lie. Um, I think that'll help me for next time because I think she won't hold it against me so much, if you know what I mean. So control and leash games, I just want to say, give your dog a bit of agency within a rule structure. That's what I'm trying to accomplish here uh, with Kool-Aid at the car dealership. That's how to make self-control a good deal for your dog. Your arrival skill set, both the arrival skills and the entry skills separately, uh, will make a huge positive difference in the emotions of any dog you share your life with. And emotions drive reinforcement. As I said, how you feel drives what you want. I personally believe that if Kool-Aid had zero degrees of freedom here, she would have been a nightmare spending the entire day with nothing to do at the car dealership. So mat work was essential, yes, but giving her agency with her mat work was a huge factor in our success together on that day. For a crazy good dog like her to be so down and chill all day long, it just, it, 
it made me very sad for her, but it made my heart sing. I hope that makes sense. It's so much more than I could have dreamed of even a short time ago. Anyway, <laughs> your arrival skill set is complete. So as I said, the arrival skills alone, those three CU pattern games in that four-part sequence on slide number 23, that will be enough to improve your life immensely with your anxious or reactive or over-eager dog. With this webinar to refer back to, you'll be able to design a simple routine that'll take you many places that you can't go now. It's a very satisfying dog training project, and I hope I've inspired you to make a start. Thank you for listening. I am ready for your questions.